Welcome to session four on spirits on assignment. We're talking about the Judas spirit. You know, we've gone over the spirit of false brethren. We've gone over the Luciferian spirit. We've gone over the Absalom spirit. All these are spirits on assignment in order to pull down the church and pull down you and I. And so we need to be aware of them. And I encourage you to uh, make sure you have, if you haven't heard session one, two, three, then have a check it out. But we're up to session four, talking about the Judas spirit. We live in a very spiritual world. And these spirits are on assignment because the devil is out to rob, kill, and destroy. And he works through people. You know, sometimes we think, you know, the devil is, is working through uh, something airy-fairy. But no, he works through people. God works through people, right? And so we need to be aware of this, the spirit of Judas. Of course, we all know, and I hope and pray we all know, that Judas was the one that portrayed Jesus with a kiss. Can you think about that for a moment? Portrayed, Je that's how close he was to Jesus. You gotta be pretty close to someone to walk up and give someone a kiss on the cheek, right? And so I know it's a, the greeting there, like a handshake, but the thing is that's how close he was to Jesus. It's coined forever, of course, in history. Betrayal is known as the Judas kiss. Uh, it's a saying, I'm not sure uh, if young people today know the saying. You know, there's a lot of sayings that are getting lost with, with time, but uh, this saying has been around since the time of Judas, the Judas kiss. And it's something in us that detests betrayal. Betrayal is a terrible thing. When people betray you, it hurts, I know. And Judas walked up to Jesus, he talked with Jesus, and, uh, you know, he saw it all happen. You know, when you think about how Judas was a disciple of Jesus for those three and a half years. He saw the miracles. He was there when they fed the 5,000, the, the, the 4,000. He was there when in the boat when Jesus walked on water. I mean, he was so close. He saw it all. He saw the leper healed. He saw the blind see. He saw it all. I mean, hello. I mean, you know, this is not some stranger, right? He even got to carry the money bag. He was a treasurer. He, that's how close he was. I mean, he is carrying the tithes and offerings as such, you know. Um, obviously, it wasn't the tithe to Jesus. It was a money bag for the poor. But he was ching ching when he walked along, you know. There was a sound to Judas. And the Judas spirit uses relationship that he has for its own gain. People want to hang around you for what they can get out of it because he was a thief. The Bible says he stole out of the money bag. And so he was hanging around for what he could get out of it. You think about that. Do you know people who are hanging around you for what they can get out of you? Maybe, you know, if you're a wealthy person, obviously, even the Bible says that the wealthy's got many friends, and it's true that wealthy people often say people hang around them for what they can get out of them. We see the big entourages, don't we, with rock stars and that people hanging around for what they can get out of them. But it doesn't just have to be money, of course. It can be lots of things. Uh, you may be able to open doors for people so people want to hang around you. Um, all kinds of reasons why people want to hang around you. If it's for their own gain, then it's a wrong motive. I hope and pray that they're hanging around you because they love you, because they want to be with you. They want to further you in life. They want to help you in life, be an asset, not a, not a deficit, right? But often, sometimes these people say they love you, but they don't really love you. Uh, they haven't got your best interest at heart. They've got their interest at heart, right? They're not really connected to you in covenant relationship. Uh, they're there because of what they can get out. Uh, they want to use you like a step in a step ladder. They want to use you to get to the top. This happens in businesses all the time. It happens in churches all the time. And uh, it's just another mountain to climb to get to where they want to go. And so, you know, they will put you down in order to get uh, to the top after they've after you have uh, been of use to them, after you've done what you can do for them, when you're no longer of use to them, you know, they've moved on to somebody else. And I've seen that in, in churches. I've, I've been, you know, a great blessing to people, prayed for them, prayed for, you know, for them to prosper and they come to that place. And next thing, you know, they've moved on because, you know, they either think they know more than you, they think they're better than you, or, you know, they, they, they view, you know, and they don't, may not even have thought about using you, but that's basically what's happened. And uh, all the years and, and so forth, you pour into people. And next thing, you know, people just like, up and leave you. And so the thing is, is that you become just a, even as a, as a church, sometimes we become just another platform to preach from. They want to use the church as a springboard to something else. And 
And the truth is that without you, nobody would have ever noticed them. Um, amazing, isn't it? I mean, who was Judas before he got to hang out with Jesus? Who was Judas before he got to hang out with Jesus? If Jesus hadn't have called him, you think about that. Jesus had made opportunities for him. Um, now Judas was in the know. Now Judas was close to the action. Now Judas was famous. He was one of the disciples. Uh, people, you know, the, 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 there's scriptures where the Greeks came to the disciples to ask them. And there are times where, you know, people came to the disciples to get uh, prayed for. And so now G Judas was walking with Jesus and he was thinking, how do I capitalize on my relationship with Jesus? How can this work for me? I've, I've had a my whole life where people want to hang out with me for what they can get out uh, uh, of me. Maybe doors that open at a conference and so forth. And once I've opened those doors, it's like goodbye, Peter, you know, and, and people do that all the time. And, and as I said, sometimes people might do it unconsciously, but, but really there's a spirit working in them uh, that they may not be, you know, be aware of. How can this work out for me? And he found Judas, listen to this statement, Judas found out that Jesus was worth more to him dead than alive. Wow, think about that. Think about that. He went out by night to the Pharisees, went out by night to the Pharisees. He struck a deal with the enemy and he walked right back in, sat down, ate a meal with Jesus. Think about that. I mean, you think about this. Here he was, he went out by night, made a deal with the Pharisees. He struck a deal with them. He went right back in, sat down and had a meal with Jesus. I've had that in my life where people have done pretty nasty, horrendous things. And then they'll come back in, have a meal with you. Next thing, it's like the last supper, you know. But in any case, um, I'm not saying, hey, um, you know, I don't want to be a martyr in it like Jesus or anything like that. I'm just saying life. And I'm sure you've got people in your life that have used you. You've got people in your life that have hung around you for what they can get out of you or what you can do for them. And once you've done it, they've moved on, right? Um, and it's just like nothing is, is uh, when Judas walked into that last supper, it's like, well, nothing's going on here. I'm just one of the boys. He just betrayed the son of God. He just betrayed his friend. He betrayed his boss. He betrayed his pastor. He betrayed his ministry companion. All these things Jesus was to him, right? And then Jesus says at the last supper, somebody in the room has betrayed me. It's like he got busted, you know, he got outed, right? But he didn't own up. He didn't confess up. He didn't repent. He didn't say, I'm sorry. He could have done right at that time. You think about this, but he drags it out. He plays it out. And the one that, uh, that loved Jesus, they were aghast, you know. Yet Jesus played along like everybody else. Is it, like, is it me, Lord, you know? And Jesus said, it's the one who dips his hand in the bowl with me. And Jesus had, had Judas do that, gave him the bread and everything. But when Judas goes out, the disciples thought he's going out to help the poor or to get some money for, for something, you know. But, he, you know, maybe Judas had shifty eyes. I don't know what it was, but he had that manipulation that people didn't think it was him. This is quite incredible because Jesus even said, well, hey, there's somebody here who betrays me. It's the one who dips his, his, his bread with me in the bowl. And then, um, you know, the thing is Judas goes out and uh, the other disciples didn't even pick up on it. Judas must be in a pretty likable kind of guy. I don't know. He must be in a good, uh, good actor. Um, and uh, maybe he's a fast talker, you know. But all four Gospels carry the story. Let's read it. It's good to read the Scriptures in Matthew 26, verse 14. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver Jesus to you? They counted him out, 30 pieces of silver. Of course, it was prophesied that this would happen, 30 pieces of silver. So from that, and silver is a price of redemption, by the way. Isn't it great to know we've been redeemed? Um, not with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus. So that from time on, he sought opportunity. Judas sought opportunity to betray him. Now, on the first day of the feast of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, where do you want us to prepare to eat the Passover for you? And Jesus said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I'll keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. The disciples did as Jesus directed them and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. 
And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And each one of them began to say, Lord, is it I? And he answered, It is he who dips his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as is written by him of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. I mean, Judas knew it was him, right? He would have been good for him for that man not to be born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? Well, talk about a hypocrite. Talk about an actor. And Jesus said, you have said it. Well, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Jesus was still prepared to have this last supper with Judas. Wow. Even when Judas came up to the garden, Jesus calls him his friend. You know, the one who betrays me, Jesus said, will dip his bread with me right now. And I guess it goes pretty awkward at that time at the Last Supper, because nobody's going for the bread, right? <laughs> I mean, if Jesus said, it's the one who dips his bread with me now, you could imagine the silence of the room and everybody, you know, holds back their bread. Everybody gets pretty scared, right? Because the 11 knew it wasn't them, but they would be pretty scared in any way because Jesus said, one in the room has betrayed me. I think everybody would be feeling really awkward. And finally, Judas goes for the bread. <laughs> ah, Wow. Is it I, he says. And talk about a little weasel when you think about it. But he knew very well who it was because he already had the 30 pieces of silver. They were bulging in his pocket. Or maybe he buried them somewhere, I don't know. But that ching ching had become clunk clunk, you know, like he was now, there's a lot of money. And in other gospels, Jesus says, Jesus says to Judas, what you have to do, do quickly. So G Judas, he wants to get ahead. He wants some financial gain. Greed was in his heart, right? Verse 47. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the 12 of the great, this is now in the garden now, uh, that we've gone on to the garden. And Jesus, of course, was praying in the garden, if it be possible, take this cup from me and so forth, so forth. And he had Peter, James and John, they'd gone to sleep and, and all that kind of stuff. And while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. And his betrayer had given them a sign, that's Judas, saying, Whoever I kiss, here's the one, seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and, and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Now, Judas spirited people use their relationship with others to get ahead. That's the bottom line. Maybe to meet someone, maybe to get somewhere, maybe for financial gain, whatever it is. But whatever it is, they will betray you in the end. That's the key. They will betray you. They will sell you off for whatever price they can get. They'll stab you in the back while giving you a kiss. That is the Judas spirit. We're going to move on to the Jezebel spirit. Now, the Jezebel spirit, hear me now can be male and female because spirits are, gen are neutral gender. And uh, so they can be used. A Jezebel spirit can come through a male person or female person. Uh, often we think of Jezebel spirit, the Jezebel of old, of course, the queen, uh, uh, the wife of Ahab. And this is where it comes from. We need to look at her and see what she did. But that Jezebel spirit, it's a spirit. Uh, the book of Revelation tells us that. And so this spirit operates through the appointment of another. They use somebody else's authority to get done what they want. I mentioned before, so many people say, well, Pastor Peter wants this. Pastor Peter said this. Pastor, and, and so really, that's like the spirit of Jezebel operating. And we'll look at Jezebel in the field of Naboth and, and see how it happens. But, uh, you know, basically they want control. Jezebel... And hopefully, again, I'm talking to Christians, you know the story. You know the story about Jezebel. She was married to King Ahab. Ahab, he was a very sulky, immature, evil king. And he wanted to buy a field, a field from the man called Naboth. Naboth had a vineyard. Now, in those days, of course, lamb is very important. It came down through the fathers. It was their heritage. Naboth didn't want to sell it. It was his inheritance. You don't sell your birthright. Naboth knew Esau's story, right? You don't want to sell your birthright. Ahab knew that as well, but Ahab wanted this vineyard. He wanted for his, his garden. And so let's read 1 Kings chapter 21. It came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel next to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So Ahab said to Naboth, give me a vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is near next to my house. And for it I will give you a vineyard better than it. 
For it seems good to you, I will give you worthless money. Sounds like a good deal, doesn't it? But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. So Ahab went to his house, sullen and displeased, because of the word which Naboth the Jezreel had spoken to him. For he said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and would eat no food. But Jezebel's wife came to him and said, Why is your spirit so solemn that you eat no food? You know, <laughs> I won't say there, but she should have come to him and said, What's up? Get up, you know. And, you know but in any case, she came and kind of like pacifies him. And he said to her, Because, you know, feel sorry for him. Because I spoke to Naboth, he's acting like a sport brat. Naboth to Jezreel and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, I, or else if it pleases you, I will give you another vineyard for it. He answered, Naboth, I, I will not give you my vineyard. Then Jezebel's wife said to him, You now exercise authority over Israel. In other words, she builds him up. Arise, eat food, let your heart be cheer, cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth. It wasn't hers to give, my friend. I will give you, she says, the, the, the vineyard. And so what she did, she wrote letters, verse 8, in Ahab's name. Notice she uses somebody else's name, somebody else's authority to get what she wants. Sealed them with a seal and sent them to the letters to the elders of the nobles who were dwelling in the city with Naboth. She wrote the letters saying, Proclaim a fast, sit Naboth with high honor among the people and seek two mean scoundrels. Oh, before him to bear witness against him, liars, deceivers, saying they have blasphemed against God and you have blasphemed against God and King. Then take him out and stone him that he may die. Wow, plotting, murder, deception. So the men of the city, the elders and nobles who were inhabitants of the city, did as Jezebel had said to them. They were manipulated. They were scared. They were under her control. Had sent, and so as it is written, the letters which she had sent to them, they proclaimed a fast, seated Naboth with high honor among the people, and two men, scoundrels, came in and sat before him. The scoundrels witnessed against him, because the Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses. And in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth has blasphemed God the king, they took him, out, him outside the city and stoned him a stone so that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. Notice she didn't cast the stones herself. She got other people to do it for her. And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money, not for Naboth is not alive but dead. So it was when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab got down, went down to take possession of the vineyard of Naboth to Jezreel. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, just by praise the Lord for the man of God, saying, Arise, go down, meet Ahab, king of Israel, who lives in Samaria. There he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he had gone down to take possession of it. You shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, you have murdered and also taken possession. And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, in the place where the dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, dogs will lick up your blood, even yours. Wow. Jezebel said, I will get it for you. I will take it. Whatever it takes, I will manipulate, I will use, and I will abuse others. But I will get it for you. She took King Ahab's signet ring and a symbol, a sign, a seal, and a wax on the letter, and Jezebel sent letters in Ahab's name. Basically, the Jezebel spirit operates through the appointment of somebody else. Jezebel uses somebody else's authority. You can see it again in families. You can see it again. Mom said this or dad said that and dad might not have said that. Uh, you can see it in businesses, obviously, and in churches. Jezebel uses somebody's authority, somebody else's position to get what they want. And you can see it in subtle ways. In the beginning form, you even hear, as I said, kids saying, well, mum said so, you know, and they manipulate you. I mean, it's amazing. And, uh, you know, we need to nip those things in the bud. I'm not saying those kids have got a Jezebel spirit, but that's the beginning of it. You know, when they use this somebody else's authority, that's why we need to pull them up on it and find out whether mum did say so. Um, but the thing is, dad said it was okay. And then as people are more open as they, as they grow in it and learn these ways, it becomes manipulation and it becomes control. And well, the pastor wants it done this way. Peter wants it done this way. And uh, using other people's names to get something done. And they even, uh, they, you give people authority to represent you. This is why we give people authority to represent all our impact team leaders and all our impact hubs. 
But you know, if they use our name to get something done, you've got to watch out because Jezebel's alive. The Jezebel spirit seeks to control the prophetic voice of the house because the prophetic voice can cut through a Jezebel spirit. People who carry a Jezebel spirit don't like it when people of authority walk into the room. The Jezebel spirit of people, they don't like authority. And so the Bible says to test the spirit, to try the spirit. One big test is how do people respond to authority? How do people respond to authority? The Jezebel spirit reacts really badly to it. You know, when you think about God, God is a God of authority, a God of order. Rebellion is not always overt. You don't always see it. Sometimes it's covert. Sometimes it's underground, undermining, right? And in the absence of authority, sometimes you don't even know that it is there. But when authority steps in, when you start, if, as a pastor, I say we're doing this, then watch the Jezebel spirit rise. And it's a spirit of rebellion. It's a satanic spirit. Jesus said an unclean spirit, when cast out, will wander in dry places seeking rest. And then, of course, if the home is not put in order, it will come back even worse. When Jesus came across a man with an unclean spirit in the synagogue, the spirit cried out, have you come to torment me before our time? They know their time will be up, right? But they don't like being challenged. They can't find rest. These, the, the spirited people that I'm talking about, uh, you know, whether it's an Absalom spirit, whether it's a, a familiar spirit, whether it's a Jezebel spirit, the Judah spirit, these people are always active. Often, amazingly, these people will get around more people in the church than the pastor. I'm amazed at some people. Anybody think of some people's full-time job? They get around so many people and they're getting around with their little motives, with their little agendas. And, uh, you know, it's like crazy. And how, you know, I find that even sometimes when people leave, leave the church, it's like, you know, of course the church is people and they got a lot of friends, I understand that. But the thing is often people get back and they get around all these people and, you know, oh, this other church I go to is better, or, you know, oh, they just go on and on. And in any case, amazing how busy they get. So how did Ahab and Jezebel end up? Well, as, as prophesied, and I'll be closing the session out with this, but 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 37, I want to help you today not to have these spirits. And if they're operating in your life, you need to repent of it. You need to get rid of it. You need to cast it out, right? Repentance is the key because I don't want to have a Jezebel spirit in my heart. I don't want to have a Judas Ab Absalom spirit and a, and, and a spirit of familiarity. And so the king Ahab died and was brought to Samaria, and they buried the king in Samaria. Then someone washed a chariot, because he died in his chariot, he got shot with an arrow, at the pool in Samaria, and the dogs lip, licked up his blood while the harlots bathed, according to the word of the Lord which he had spoken. So Ahab ended up exactly the same way. Now Jezebel, 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 26, we'll, we'll begin reading in verse 30, I think. When Jehu came to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, she put paint on her eyes and adorned her head and looked through a window. Then as Je Jeho entered the gate, she said, Is it peace, Semi, murderer of your master? I'd love you to read the whole story. It's a great story. And he looked up at the window and said, Who's on my side? Who? And there were two or three eunuchs looked out at him. And, and, and Jehu said to the eunuchs, Throw her down. So they threw her down. I mean, <laughs> throw her down and throw her down again, you know. And some of her blood splattered on the wall, on the horses, and he trampled her underfoot. And when he'd gone in, he ate and drank. And then he said, go now and see to this accursed woman and bury her, for she was a king's daughter and also a king's wife. Yeah. But So they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet of the palms of her hands. This is a gross story. Therefore they came back and told him, and he said, this is a word of the Lord which was spoken by the servant, uh, Elijah the Tishbite saying on the plot of ground at Je the Jezreel dogs will eat the flesh of Jezebel and the corpse of Jezebel shall be his refuge on the surface of the field and the plot of Jezreel so they'll say here lies Jezebel wow so hey not a good ending right the book of Revelation talks about Jesus it talks about to one of the churches the Jezebel spirit you know they are alive and well today and so, sure, this happened in the natural, but it, it's alive in the spirit. Just like the Judas spirit is alive, the uh, Absalom spirit's alive and well, and the Judah and the uh, the Jezebel spirit. So, a test: How do you? How do I respond to authority? That's a big test. How do we respond to accountability? That's a good test. 
How do we respond to change? Because often these spirits develop power bases. How do we respond to another person's favour? And so we need to take a, a look at all these four people and how they all ended up. Listen now as I bring this to a close. How all these four people that I've mentioned, and that well, I've mentioned more than four, but the main characters, Joseph's brothers ended up living in a famine. Lucifer was cast down and the lake of fire awaits him. Because in session one, two and three and four, I've mentioned these. Absalom, because Joseph, remember the familiar spirit, Lucifer, the Luciferian spirit, Absalom, the Absalom spirit, he hung himself in a tree. That's how he ended up. He hung himself in a tree. Judas also hung himself. Absalom, by the way, his hair got caught and he was left dangling, right? He got hung in a tree. He didn't go and do what Judas did. Judas hung himself. Jezebel was eaten by the dogs. All I'm saying is all of these people who had a spirit operating in their lives and that the same spirit's alive and well today ended up in a bad place, ended up in a wrong place. Um, apart from uh, Naboth, the one who was betrayed, who just got pushed uh, out because of, uh, of their betrayal, Joseph, we've, he went from the pit to the palace and Jesus, of course, went from the uh, cross to the crown. Amen. And so I want to encourage you in relation to uh, these sessions on familiar spirits. You know, I've got some sessions on, on some tests for pastors on how to handle this. But, uh, and, and I want to encourage you to go back over these sessions because they are alive and well. And it's not a matter of dealing with them one time and, and we're free of them forever. These people will continue to come into our lives. And it's not just also looking out for people with those spirits. It's guarding our heart that we don't get the spirit as well. We don't catch these spirits because these spirits are looking for people to operate from. And so we guard a guard over our heart with all diligence. Amen. So God bless you. I hope and pray you've enjoyed these sessions on Spirits on Assignment.